And it's a great pleasure né, to, to have this, this uh, seminar, because it, CIDAC, see the, the major purpose of CIDAC, and you, you can see later, is to aggregate here a huge amount of data. Uh, you are doing a lot of different projects né, using national, Brazilian national databases here, and integrate this data. Uh, and uh, you, different uh, governmental agents from Brazil grant to see that access to identify data yeah, from a uh, great Brazilian database. Uh, and the uh, CIDAX houses, uh, uh, for example, all the mortality data of Brazil yeah, since 2000, yeah, identify data. Houses the hospitalization data from Brazil since 2008. How is the birth data from Brazil since 2000? Then this make possible integrating this data create, to create a large structure, yeah, uh, such as the 100 million cohort, Brazilian cohort. And more recently, you create a huge birth cohort, yeah, that is so far have been 24 million kids in this cohort. Yeah. Then. Uh, 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 talk with few, né, the interest on environmental question that uh, we have, then you start to think in, uh, to think more serious on, on that, yeah. And the seminar, in some ways, I start points of ideas né, to integrate environmental data to the system, yeah, to be made possible, yeah, to develop, yeah, or to explore environmental question, né, using all the complex system of data already accumulated in that. Né? This is a, a, a first as a start point, as I said, yeah? and you uh, uh, try to explore a possibility that appear very, very soon, né? that if you have a leading project on ASMA yeah, from the NIGR in the UK, and there are a possibility that an extension of this project could be dedicated to explore environmental question. Né? Then uh, you put together, as you know each other for a long time, yeah, in a, even in talking about you, so that it would, it would be a huge possibility yeah, if you put the data accumulator right in CDAX, including on ASMA, yeah, and to put the, 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 the idea to integrate to these databases né, more or environmental, new environmental related data. Then this is a start point. Né, I, we need a lot of expertise on that. Yeah, I have very few. Yeah, few also. I don't have so much. Yeah, I have been working a bit in, in, in environmental question. Then I, I have some ideas, but you don't you don't have the technologies, methods, a way to do that. Yeah. Then the idea was to convey a group of people, yeah, to start a discussion, yeah, how the, the, the chances, how the possibilities, how the efforts necessary, yeah, to integrate this uh, on the, all this data on the already existing data in CDAX. Then uh, the general idea of the seminar is to have it for two days, yeah, and there is a presentation, yeah, technical presentation for different people yeah, that have been working the topic. And on Tuesday afternoon, you have some time to make a reflection on the project. Yeah? Then this is a summary of the idea, yeah, that you, uh, it's a very open discussion, yeah, you hope to have a lot of presentation, have a lot of it, yeah, interactions, yeah. And then on Tuesday afternoon, you Try, you try to fox on the possibilities, on the né, extension, on the né, challenges, difficulties, yeah, to, to set up such project here in CIDAD. Yeah, then I'd like to feel, yeah, the, 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 this meeting was uh, some money from the NHR né, project from FIL and some money from uh, other project from CIDAD, yeah, that he, the Brazilian people was, né, uh, supported by pro internal projects from CDAX and the external people come, come to through NHR support to uh, grant that feel leading this grant. Then I'd like to thank you and all of you for being here yeah, for these two days and give your time to 
help you out. And sure that you hope at the end you, know, you create a kind of network. Nah, you know, it's not uh, for free yet if you wish. <laughs> you hope to create the base of a network of collaboration, yeah, through this yeah idea. SIDAC uh, is a kind of hub, yeah, you have this is part of this SIDAC purpose is to create here yeah, uh, to have this huge set of data, the known alone can use or explore such data. Né? Then CDAX need the, a lot of intelligence around here, yeah, and the, in some way you are building that here yeah, to create different kind of network interrelations yeah, with different groups yeah, that uh, explore uh, the data existing here. Okay? Phil? Mauricio, I think you've covered most of what I want to say. Um, I mean, Mauricio and I have worked for many years, collaborated for many years together and with Alvaro here as well. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Philip Cooper. I'm based at St. George's in London, and I also have a link, a strong link, with Ecuador with the International University in Quito. And as Mauricio mentioned, this meeting came around following a discussion we had at a meeting about a year ago in Birmingham at a, a, a meeting of researchers from the, funded by the NIHR, National Institute of Health Research which is like the research funding arm of the National Health Service in the UK. And we were talking about the impact of climate change on health. And when we went to look at the literature on that, we couldn't find a lot of information on that, really. The literature that there is is, very, is around infectious diseases, like malaria and dengue, vector-borne diseases, but there's not a lot of research there. And I think this is, I think many of us would agree that climate change is the issue of our generation. I think it's important to start supporting research looking at the impact of climate change on health impacts. So the, uh, the aim of the present meeting is to sort of bring together people with very diverse expertise to start to look at how a changing environment, uh, not just ecolo in the ecologic sense, but also in the social and economic sense, is affecting, is affecting human health. Um, and the context of climate change. And one of the, one of the, one of the uh, reasons for this meeting at this particular time is that we have the opportunity to apply for funding. So we have a, a current project um, looking at, uh, with Alvaro here in Salvador, looking at um, the impact, well, we're trying to improve asthma management in, in Ecuador and Brazil. And we have the opportunity to apply for extra funding. And so we thought we'd use this opportunity to try and set up, uh, get people together and build expertise in uh, social changes, economic changes, um, environmental changes. Uh, expertise both here in, in Salvador and CEDAX, but also to set up a satellite group in Quito in Ecuador. Um, so that's really uh, the motives for this particular meeting. I'd like to thank Mauricio and his team here for providing us with location and the organization for the meeting. Um, and I hope that uh, as, as a consequence of this meeting, we have, we're able to establish long-term collaborations to, to address uh, environmental change, social changes, economic changes in the context of, of climate change. Okay, uh, only a, a question is that uh, this meeting will be, uh, the plan is to transmit this meeting, yeah, and record this meeting. I send an email, ask people, some people say okay, but no one say no. I would like to put the question yeah, to, to ask if someone is a guest to record the meeting and to transmit the meeting if there is any. Okay? But he, later we would be signing yeah, something yeah, to, to confirm that. <laughs> Okay, uh, we'll try to, to, to keep the meeting to around the half past 12 at the maximum, okay? Because the lunch is, there is a small restaurant downstairs. Yeah, they have, they, the lunch will be there, yeah? And if you don't arrive soon, the, 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 the food is over. Food is over, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the food is over. Then you need to be careful about that, yeah, to have food to eat, yeah, by, by yeah, in time. Yeah, and then you hope to finish at the five o'clock. And the idea is to join all the people to dinner tonight. Yeah, I think that's the, the day that all the people will be here. Yeah, you organize yeah, uh, 
uh, thank to dinner tonight and it will not you, you it will not be far from the hotel yeah then people can go to the hotel and <coughs> then we uh, at the restaurant yeah but it's closer to the hotel we'll be close to the hotel yeah but there is transport to go back yeah as we arrange to come yeah on the car and then there is transport after the the meet finish uh, at around five o'clock okay just a technical issue is uh, ross is ross Anderson still there can he? Yes, I think so, no? Uh, yes, yes, I'm still here. Can you can you hear us okay? Yes, very clearly. Okay, only you don't have bad shit, and then maybe it would be nice if some uh, everyone give the names yeah, to the other. There is a small bill here of the people we talk, going to talk, but it would be nice if someone said, I mean, there's only the name, yeah, because the bill is here. Do the other Hi. people know? I'm John Olson, I'm a researcher at the University of Glasgow. And I'm going to talk in this first. Uh, my name is Mauro Sanchez, I'm from the University of Brasilia. Uh, my name is Alejandro, I'm from Ecuador, from the International University of Ecuador. I'm James Sorazino, I'm from London School of Economics. Gervasio uh, Santos, I'm from the Federal University of Bahia, and I'm here from Sudax. I'm Denise Duque, I'm from London School of Economics. Enrique Noel uh, from the University of Bahia. Uh, I'm Marian Sancho, a uh, postdoc research uh, here in SIDAX. I'm Jose Pignino, I'm a research assistant here at SIDAX. Yep. Okay, I'm <coughs> Roberto Andrade uh, from SIDAX and uh, University of Federal Bahia. Hi, I'm Ana Menezes from the London School of Economics. Hi, I'm Nelson Gouveia from the University of Sao Paulo. I'm Anderson Freitas, and I'm researcher in SIDAX at the University of Bahia. Hi, my name is Kyle, I'm from SIDAX uh, in Federal University of Bahia. My name is, is Christophe, I'm from uh, Pio Cruz, Rio. I'm Chou Tinshan, I'm from Santa Roberta Alvaro Cruz from Federal University of Bahia, Salvador. Okay, then Alberto is going to give you the start point. Okay, uh, hi everyone. Uh, we have a full schedule, <laughs> five uh, presentations, okay? We do not put the exact time to start and to begin, but let's see if we do in about uh, uh, half an hour for each participant to make the presentation. So let's say 20, 25 minutes to, to present and then some 10 to 5 minutes to, to close the, the discussion and so on. Maybe if we <coughs> go straight, uh, we still have a little time at the end of the session to, to make some uh, comments, general comments, okay? Um, I will talk about you, about the forms, to, to allow for, allow for uh, transmitting and recording, and so forms are here, so you can uh, send to you, or you can come here later and, and address, okay? So I hope all uh, presentations are already right here, uh, and so let's start with uh, Gustavon, okay? Who is going to talk about contextual variables and epidemiological analysis, contributions of remote sensing and geoprocessing? So, uh, 
I'll try to, uh, I mean, the first uh, presenter, I'll try to connect some, some concepts in, in epidemiology, geography, economy, and sociology. And, and I was taught many, many years ago with the mean kind of study about suicide in France. It was very important to create new science, new, new field of study that is in sociology, but he said that, he said that uh, suicide is a social fact and it's, it's influenced by religion, social values, also the, the manner uh, communities and, uh, and people are related and, and this can, can, can make people make people suicide. So, but he was very uh, unhappy in, in oh, sorry in one sentence he did he, he said that suicide uh, protesters suicide uh, more more frequent, frequently than than Catholics. So based on this man. He, he pointed out that uh, the Protestant areas were uh, more in, in this area were more, more common suicide, and and he did uh, what we call today an, an ecological test. He was completely condemned by epidemiologists, statisticians, etc. Because uh, basically, because he uh, aggregated, he, he was a certain. Uh, an aggreg aggregate of, uh, of uh, people or population in the in territories. Uh, he, he, in fact, he, his object of study was uh, uh, communities and states and regions in France. So everything, every, he didn't know. Uh, Nothing about about the social economic status of the people, out uh, uh, behavior, and he, he, the uh, the true uh, object of study was was the territory where where this this frequency was measured. On the other side, no sorry. On the other side, after that, where uh, many after many critics. Uh, people started to, to, or just, well, uh, sorry, uh, people, uh, uh, epidemiologists and, 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 and social, social science uh, researchers focus on, on the, the individuals because the, the out health outcome happens in, 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 in is embodied in, in Individuals where uh, genetic factors, behavior factors, and socioeconomic factors influence the, the, the outcome, but also uh, other uh, other factors like uh, environment, social capital, resources, hazard, and also uh, uh, social status, socioeconomic status uh, influence the outcome. But the, the, in this uh, kind of model, we have also a mistake because uh, some of these uh, factors are contextual, not, they not, don't, don't belong to people. Uh, for instance, uh, Durkheim said that wars decrease uh, suicide rates. So he's speaking about countries, not people. People about war. Uh, Fight, but uh, the war is big, the war is an attribute of, uh, of uh, the territory. So, what can, can we do with this very very old uh, debate in, in epidemiology? We have some some factors, yes, it, which influence the uh, or comp comp uh, comprise the, the territory, and some. Of this, some variables that belong to is an attribute of uh, people, individuals, genetic behavior, and socioeconomic. Uh, environment researchers ha hazard belongs to uh, are attributes of territory, and uh, curiously, uh, socioeconomic status are both 
uh, uh, an attribute of territory and individual, but can, can be different. You can be a poor, pe pe poor people in, in, in a rich area or vice versa. Well, there was a, a little old uh, study in, I think, in New York or Washington, I don't know, uh, trying to recover this, this kind of uh, contextual approach. Uh, the, the title of this uh, article was very interesting. Uh, she, she, she mentions that a, a broken window can be a, a proxy, a proxy of risk uh, of gonorrhea in, in some areas. So she said that uh, this kind of uh, building environment can can promote, promote the gonorrhea and, and not this one. So she, she proposed a lot, lots of uh, contextual uh, variables to study this, to di differentiate this kind of variables. So again, we have uh, the territory, the individuals. Uh, we can, yes, aggregate individual va uh, variables into, into the territory. Yeah, this, is, this is a classical study like that, like uh, Durkheim did. And then obtain some, some socioeconomic and, and, uh, and uh, population demographic, uh, demographic uh, indicators. But some some of this uh, some of some uh, variables can be must must be obtained by other kind of uh, of information source like satellite data, environmental monitoring data, social media, and, and government agencies, etc. Uh, uh, individual data can be obtained by. Uh, census, survey, health surveys, administrative data, like, like where uh, people in syntax are. are uh, <coughs> so, this is a, a, an example of uh, the co coexistence of uh, the, the uh, joint influence of uh, uh, individual an individual outcome happening in, in different contexts. Like, for instance, uh, this is diarrhea incidence. It decreases with uh, when when uh, uh, water supply coverage uh, in Brazil increases. So mainly after uh, the coverage higher than seventy percent, there is a decrease in. in in diarrhea incidents. But if, if the, the municipality is, is subject to, to drought, uh, uh, we have the double, around double of uh, incidence rates. So it, it doesn't, it doesn't, this kind of uh, distinction it's not, it doesn't belong to people, it's an attribute of the environment, of climate. It, uh, people don't know, don't even know if they are in a climate, in a drug situation, condition. Uh, they simply use the, use the water from, from, okay. And, uh, and, and the, the effect in, in, in infectious diseases are, are very different in this case. Well, what, what can we do to incorporate the, the uh, territory? Territory data in, 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 in epidemiological studies. The, the, the first and more easy thing to do is the, uh, to aggregate or to count uh, points inside a polygon. We have here, let's say, three three cases in a population of uh, some thousand of, uh, and we can calculate the rate, okay? Well, this is a very simple thing to do in, in, in GIS, but something new we can do is, is to use uh, no administrative uh, area. So, we, this can, in this case, it, it is a uh, K, 
catchment area of uh, uh, basic health unity. But it can be could be uh, water sheet, water water hydrological basing, uh, basing or uh, vegetation classification. Everything can be aggregated in new areas if you have this health uh, events georeferencing. Uh, we can do as well to strip uh, if we have, for for instance, some uh, a survey of uh, geocode or uh, geocode health events. We can obtain from the map some some information we don't have in our uh, survey or, or in our uh, information health information <coughs> register. For instance, the altitude people live or the sanitation conditions where people live. We, we don't need to ask people about the sanitation and vegetation. It's impossible to, 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 to require someone, uh, what's the vegetation in your area? This is an absurd question in surveys. But we, we can extract that from, from maps using simple Boolean, we say Boolean operations. And uh, satellite meme images also. This is satellite images is something, something important to bring back the context to context to to have data. Uh, in this case, Leishmaniosis is in, in Rio. It shows that vegetation has rainfall forest. Uh, rain rainfall sorry, uh, has an important role in. in transmission, uh, but uh, the image is not just a beautiful picture to be behind the uh, of map. We can also use uh, satellites to derive some some uh, probably show we will we'll, we'll talk about that too. How to create or how to to model. Uh, some important indicators we can we can we can incorporate in in, in, in epidemiological studies like for instance we we have studied the, the effect of uh, the recent uh, fire forest fire in, in the Amazon and uh, this is an estimate of uh, particulate matter and this one is for for carbon monoxide for the whole. Uh, Continent, including Ecuador, which is a little bit protected because of the Andes. Right? So, we, if we have this, if this is not simple. In the show, we will probably talk about that. It's not simple to, to, to make this kind of estimate of, of uh, atmospheric pollution, uh, but we can we can estimate the the expo exposure of people. Uh, People spotted uh, from this uh, kind of image, from this kind of uh, model, and integrate this uh, this this variable, new variable in, in, into uh, our epidemiological studies. This is another thing we have we are trying to do uh, in a more local studies, trying to then identify a kind of dengue landscape, but it can it can be used also in in. in for other, other diseases. Uh, the dense, uh, dense uh, urban area, residential area in Rio, uh, a more sparse uh, uh, residential area. This is a, a, a commercial, not, not residential area. So we probably have uh, different fragments of uh, this landscape that influences, uh, for instance, uh, for asthma, people people are blaming pollen, pollen. For us, uh, they, they, it can be used to, to estimate or create a proxy of uh, exposure to pollen, for instance. And finally, we have uh, we have this uh, we are coordinating this uh, climate and health observatory in Fiocruz, which uh, 
uh, it's a beautiful site, but also uh, it uh, make uh, available many, many data in forms of maps, climate models, uh, uh, graphs for specific areas, <coughs> and they have felt different have outcome. I will try to summarize. And I think Brazil is, has a particularity that uh, we have many, many agencies. We have still uh, a law that obliges uh, the, 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 that, that, that dissemination. So uh, almost all, all ag ag agencies have uh, a site uh, making available the, the data. For instance, this is water, water, uh, the water agency, the health of uh, Brazilian uh, format department, health and direct department, they had uh, the Bureau of Census, Census, Census Bureau, Secretary uh, from EP, and the, 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 the challenge we have in this case is uh, connect this kind of uh, this uh, data service into one into one integrated database, so the user can 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 access this the many 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 indicators, and this is almost done in our in our department there in Fiocruz Rio. Uh, I must say something about other informal, I don't know how to say it, informal or social or voluntary data we can collect also. For instance, this is a tweet from Nego do Borel saying that he had dengue, probably he had dengue. And <laughs> if we have many, many of this information, we can say that something is happening in, with dengue in, some areas, uh, people from the, uh, federal, uh, Minas Gerais Federal University and, and Fiocruz in Minas Gerais is trying to, to uh, treat this kind of, uh, kind of uh, data to, to detect uh, outbreaks and etc. And in, we, we are in, in, in the Federal University of Espírito Santo, we are developing a capture, a, a robot to capture uh, news in the media. So if we, we, we can use some uh, keywords to extract uh, uh, this uh, news, we, we have a good experience in that, which, which was monitoring uh, a severe drought in, in we, have, we are here in Salvador, a uh, little bit north of, from here, which affect thousands of uh, people, and, and the dozens of people died because of diarrhea in this drought, uh, during this drought uh, situation. <coughs> we monitored uh, uh, drought, we using this index system, maybe people know it, it's a vegetation index that is decreasing a long time in, in the Sertão, the, the inner, inner uh, northeast region of Brazil. And during this year, it happened this very severe pro, uh, drop in, in the area. So at the, at the end of, uh, of this drop period, there was a, an outbreak of, of uh, diarrhea, which was uh, obviously uh, captured, uh, reduced by, by health information system, oh, and also the, a, me, a media peak. Uh, no, uh, some news about what, uh, some, something happening in, the, in, the, in some cities, in maybe five or ten cities, uh, something strange uh, outcomes uh, during this this uh, drought uh, period, and uh, it, it, this was important also not only be because we have a coincidence of uh, 
media news and uh, and uh, that that's from diarrhea, but also we could explain what was happening because of media, using this content, the content of uh, media news to understand what was happening there. So finally, uh, I must say that this uh, contextual information is complementary and even sometimes contradictory from uh, to the individual variables like Mauricio is, uh, is very Productive, and they are said in this kind of uh, relation, environment, immunity, individual immunity, and group immunity. For instance, uh, not sorry, not vaccinated people surrounded by vaccinated people has a completely different outcome. Or a large group like like the drought, a uh, large group of population suddenly exposed uh, is. Uh, is as an out, uh, health outcome is completely different from the permanent exposure. And uh, context data must be obtained from external information sources, sources not just uh, aggregating individual data. And this contextual uh, information can be also qualitative, can be even subjective, can, can, be, can be based on subjective uh, information to complement this uh, complex models using social networks, information, uh, interviews, etc. And finally, GIS can help us a lot trying to, <laughs> to make a kind of order in this mess. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Some any comments from, uh, about the presentation by Cristóbal. Thank you for a very nice presentation, Cristóbal. I wonder whether you have considered using Google Trends mm. to inform your uh, research. Yeah. For, it's very interesting because, uh, for instance, for Zika, Zika, the Zika outbreak in, in Brazil, in the northeast, uh, Google Trends were very important to not, not exactly to detect the uh, peaks of uh, concerns, but uh, to, to make, to make this concern more evident. Like uh, Zika, for, for instance, for Zika, it was considered a very suave, uh, no, non-pathological infection. And then uh, it happened that the outbreak of uh, uh, brain, the, the neurological disorders, many, many. And then the, the peak of Google Trend, the, there was a peak of Google Trend. So we, it's, it's interesting because it makes objective and subjective uh, concerns uh, in the same platform like Google Trend. Google Trend can, like now, uh, coronavirus is the search for information in, 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 in Google Trends are picking. Uh, so it, it's, it's important as a context of something that worries people, something that concerns people. Uh, more than, more than quantitative food, we, we can never say how much people are affected, but something is happening in the end of the We can visualize that. Yeah, but in your experience, are uh, all the challenges that uh, your lab has in terms of integrating these different data sets, now, what, what's the, the major, you know, yeah, challenges and the, the methodological difficulties, some methodological yeah. challenges, yeah, that uh, you have. Because it's a fascinating area, the integrating data yeah. from different sources, nah, individual, aggregated, subjective, objective, yeah, but this is a complex, yeah, question that is in science nowadays, nah, to integrate, yeah, different sources of data, yeah, to, to produce, yeah, 
raising them explanation, raising them explanation about facts. I will say something. I have a little hope about that with you, because <laughs> our experiences are, are based on ret retrospective studies. You know, we 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 knew that. Uh, we knew that uh, there was a draw in the northeast. We knew there was a, a, a flood in the south region, and then we recovered uh, subjective, objective health data, demographics, etc. But we never did the reverse uh, direction. Never. I think with, with the big data mining, good data, we can do the, we can, we can do the reverse, uh, the, to the studies in the, the reverse direction. We can detect health outcomes happening in some areas and to understand the context, the, uh, what exactly happened there. We use it, we use to, to know something a large, uh, a huge uh, disturbance in the environment, and to study health effects. We never, that we were not able to detect a health, uh, health, a huge health change, in, like a, uh, an outbreak, like a unusual uh, trend of uh, mortality, and then understand the context. This is a, a challenge we have. <laughs> so we, 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 are, we are studying disasters. This is the case. This is the problem. We, and there are many, many visible disasters in Brazil now. Many. Some are in the, the news, and some are hidden in some in, in the area in the Amazon. We don't know. I was really interested in your motivation of the stars. Point out that we can't um, assume that regional aggregates are going to tell us much about individuals. Um, but then, with with the GIS techniques you're showing, the, the first step is sort of to, to regionally aggregate. How, how do you then take that back to the individual level? How to use aggregate area to the individual? Yeah, and, and in particular because of this, this critique. Yeah, yeah, but I don't. I, I agree that uh, we we must use aggregate data. So for instance, you can ask people: Are you employed, unemployed, employed or unemployed? And the aggregate the aggregate measure will be the proportion of unemployed. So this is a very important, very important indicator for, for the territories. Even if people is, is employed, people employed uh, in an area where there are many, many unemployed people, this and this relationship I think is interesting. It's not just the people and not just the territory, but this like do kind of tried to to do a uh, century of years ago, uh, trying to understand this relation with between people and territory. This is very important. So, great job. Okay. So, let's close the first uh, presentation.
is under the project called Salurbao, Urban Health in Latin America, that CIDAT is also part of, which are about to some colleagues here. And, and it's basically on a matter of air pollution uh, in Latin America, and we try to explore uh, some issues of inequality in the exposure to air pollution, uh, but also some effects on mortality. This is preliminary results of this uh, of this project, but I think can bring can bring some ideas for you know, future projects that we are thinking about. Um, so just yeah, some motivation. I mean, the Latin America is very urbanized. We have some preliminary um, studies from WHO saying 110 million people exposed to unhealth levels of air pollution, 58,000 58, deaths per year. But all these uh, numbers are based on analysis of only 117 cities in Latin America that have ground monitoring stations of air pollution. And, but based on these cities, I mean, and with these numbers, we, uh, we see that uh, less than 5% of the cities in Latin America are complying with the WHO guidelines for, for air pollution. So then the idea of this study is to examine the current levels of air pollution using uh, satellite data to cover the whole of Latin America, uh, compare the levels with the WHO guidelines for PM2.5, uh, try to explore issues of inequality in terms of exposure, basically by age, gender, and socioeconomic variables. Uh, also to, to see if air pollution are associated with some uh, socioeconomic, but also built environment uh, variables that we also collected for, for this project. And some associations with uh, cardiovascular and respiratory diseases. Uh, so this is the, the countries which are part of this study, the Salurbao study. Uh, it's 11 countries in, in Latin America. Uh, we included in for this study only cities with 100,000 or plus uh, inhabitants. Uh, and cities in this study are defined in a different way. I mean, because the, 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 the way we classify cities in Brazil are different from Argentina, from Peru. Uh, the, the, the way we call them are different. So we have to define, have a, a, a system that could be applied for the whole Latin America. And basically, we, they are defined quantitatively by, by satellite imagery, but also uh, using the, you know, the, the, the administrative boundaries as well. And then we have three levels. We have the L1, the level one, which we are calling cities, but are, in Brazil we would call uh, metropolitan areas. Uh, the level two, which are the cities inside the metropolitan area, but it, this varies in, among the countries. That's why we are calling uh, L1 or L2 and not cities or sub cities. And we have a third level, which are still not being used because this is more uh, a bit more difficult because inside. Uh, 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 city or administrative unit, we are using census uh, tracks to define new areas. This is going to be our level three. And for our pollution, <coughs> we use the, the estimates from uh, this atmospheric composition analysis group of the of House University in, in the US, or no, I think it's in Canada. Uh, they have, you know, measurements of PM2.5 uh, since 1998 up to 2018. They have annual means, it's already calculated. That we, I mean, it's a very easy data to, to, to work on. Uh, the, the measurements of PM2.5 were, um, you know, adjusted by, you know, using monitoring, uh, monitoring stations where they exist, and also geochemical uh, Models to you know to model this data to have this data, and it's I mean you can download this data on grid cells by uh, of um, around one kilometer square uh, size. I think I have a, a picture. Uh, all this in red here are the cities that we are analyzing in Southern Ball. It's about 140, uh, 1,463 L2s subsidy units and 400 and something. Uh, 470 uh, L1s, metropolitan areas. And this is sort of the, the, the idea of the grid cells. This is a uh, one kilometer square area, and for each point we have a value of PM2.5, and then we can uh, average this for, you know, for a, 
administrative district or, or, or you know, one of the our L1 or L2 levels. So to have the, the, the annual means. And in this case, I'm only uh, analyzing 2015, although we have a series from 1998 to 2018. And the other variables, I mean, the variables that we use to compare the air pollution using uh, country <coughs> GDP uh, per capita, although this was the preliminary analysis, now we are using, uh, we downloaded data for GDP at the city level, so we are now using uh, country at the city level. It's a multi-level analysis, so that's why I'm including, you know, the variables, but uh, uh, which level they are, in, they are uh, you know, included in this study. So population uh, at the city level, population 2015, Population growth, education, water and sewage connection, and overcrowding at the sub-city level, a more a smaller unit. Uh, and for built environment variables, we have also at the city and the sub-city level, uh, population density, fragmentation, which is the number of urban patches, which give us a, an idea of the, the, the way the cities are sort of, you know, uh, organized in terms of the area. Uh, gasoline prices, and an index for transit, which is BRT, metro, and aero trends, or, or uh, no, it's not really metro, but different trends that are on the metropolitan area. And at the sub-city level, we have intersection density, which is also a measure of, you know, urbanization, is the local node density uh, of streets, so each uh, street connects to, a, to another on a node. Uh, we have a measure of uh, congestion, the travel delay index, and green is the NDVI, which is normalized deviation vegetation index. Uh, we examined this for mortal mortality for respiratory and cardiovascular disease, and the approach was uh, using you know the multi-level model to have the interface interclass correlation coefficient to see variations in air pollution, PM2.5, uh, among cities, between cities, between sub-cities and between countries, to see where the, 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 the variation of their pollution, of the difference in air pollution were. And, and the linear mixed models, we, we use it with two and three levels, uh, sometimes only considering you know, country and L1 or, or C, or country, city and sub-city. Um, and this is a plot of, you know, annual means of PM2.5 in 2015 for all 471 uh, Latin American cities. This is by country, and this is the WHO guideline for PM2.5, which is 10 micrograms per cubic meter. And we can see that there's quite a lot of variation among countries and quite a lot of cities uh, which are above this. Uh, this the guideline. Uh, in this one, we have the, actually it's the same idea, but it's the number of uh, cities on each country uh, and the percentage of cities. In general, we have like 40% of cities in Latin America are breathing air which are above the air quality guideline. And, and of course, this varies a lot. If you see in Chile, it means that 6% of cities in Chile and about 50% in Mexico are cities that are above the guideline. Uh, in terms of you know, the distribution of exposure by, by age, which is in this one, and not actually this is age, no, this is gender, this is gender. Uh, we didn't see any difference, I mean, the proportion of male or female. There are some studies in literature saying that women in general are, uh, can be more exposed, and also they can be, you know, uh, more prone to develop disease by exposure to air pollution. But we didn't see any, at least on this analysis, any difference in exposure by gender. Uh, a bit of a, uh, an increase in exposure among the, the, the elderly people. Uh, those with 65 on over, in general, are more exposed than young generation. And this might mean that uh, those you know, the elderly are living sort of more central areas, which are usually more polluted. Uh, we try to explore some difference by, by education, but there's not much difference in terms of exposure. The, 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 
the bars, basically they are comparing um, university in, in, in above universe or, or up to uh, complete primary uh, uh, education in terms of exposure. But as I said, I mean, there's no much difference in terms of education or exposure in, for PM 2.5. Any summary of these results means that, I mean, this 371 cities in Southern Bowl that we are analyzing, they cover about 300 million people in Latin America. And I have to remember that in Latin America, there are about 600, a bit over 600 million. So this uh, study, which is covering 11 countries, is sort of covering about half of Latin America. Uh, nearly 40%, 38% of the cities are above their color guidelines, with quite huge difference in among the countries. Uh, this means like 170 million among this 300 million, 172 are exposed to levels which are above the air quality guideline. Uh, among them, 12 million are children, which are supposed to be more prone or more susceptible for air pollution problems, asthma, for instance. Uh, and again, this varies a lot among countries in Chile. 85, nearly 90% of the population are, you know, breathing bad air compared to 9% in Central America. As I mentioned, no difference by gender, no striking difference by location, and the elderly usually more exposed than, than the others. And in terms of uh, the intra-class cross correlation, this is, you know, the, the, the violence component in the new model, the model only with the built environment variables, the one with the social environment variables, and the full model. And basically, you can see that most of the variation in air pollution levels is within cities and between uh, uh, within L L2 and between L1s and L2s. And only 13% is between countries. So most of the difference, most of the variation in air pollution is local. Basically, this is what this model is showing us. And most of the variation is local, is that the, you know, among cities in a, in, within a country. Uh, this is the, it's a preliminary model, but it's just to give us an idea of the, the, the variables. Is a, as I said, it's a multi-level model, so there is some variables at the country level, like the GDP, which is now being replaced by a city GDP. Uh, <coughs> some variables at the, the, the uh, city level L1 and some variables at uh, smaller uh, subsidy uh, level. And, and you can see, I mean, some of the variables were significant at the univariate uh, model and some remain at the uh, multivariate model. But basically, you can see that some features of the city, the patch density, the way, the fragmentation that I mentioned, which is a predictor of PM2.5, uh, population density is also predictor although on the other uh, on the other direction the intersection density the 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 the, um, the way that the the, the, the city is controlled I mean the, the, the number of basic intersection densities uh, the amount of roads interconnecting with each other which is also a predictor for air pollution and Readers, which we'd expect would be, you know, having a very protective effect, didn't show up much. Uh, was a protective effect on the univariate model, but not on the on the on the multivariate analysis. And in terms of health effects, this is uh, for cardiovascular disease and respiratory diseases. Again, the the single the, the new model, and then the model with you know all set of control variables. But basically, you can see, and it's not much variation uh, on the adjustments, we have one or 1.3% 1 increase uh, in cause-specific mortality for a uh, one microgram increase in the annual mean of PM2.5. So this is basically the, the, what we can see in these Latin American cities. And just to acknowledge some people that have been working with me on this, and I'm hoping for those questions. So, well, it was a very nice presentation. Uh, to be honest, I had the opportunity to, to know about this project two or three years ago. 
in the International Conference of Women's Health. Okay. I'm not quite sure it was in Portugal. I, I met Anna there yes, as well. Yes. And I asked her one question, why Ecuador, Venezuela, and Bolivia uh, yeah. They are not in the study at the beginning. Yeah. Of the, that was like yeah, because, uh, I made the OG. <laughs> well, that's a question that I can't answer because I don't know. <laughs> I think, I think, I mean, this is what I think. Uh, uh, the whole process was, you know, by you know knowing people. I, I don't know exactly how you know, the whole network because I I think when my researcher and I enter on the project, this is was already there. I mean, there was uh, quite a bunch of colleagues. And from all these countries, but there was no one from Venezuela, Ecuador. Because two years ago, I offered, I offered to be the guy in Ecuador, right? And I said, I have all the information. <laughs> yeah. I sent an email. You both contact you, right? Yeah. So I don't know, I'm not, I'm not the PI on that. <laughs> <laughs> it's the big guy, the big guy. <laughs> yeah, no, one more issue mentioned this meeting and said, whoa, well, key to Ecuador is a wow. Well, but it is not on this process, it's gonna be <laughs> weird. But yeah, I don't know, I don't know why. Well, in the future, yeah, you have a chance. <laughs> I'll be happy to be. So, yeah. uh, I have two questions. First, I, I don't present 2015 data, but uh, if you wanted, with the data that, that are available, could you look at a subset of cities and, and look at trends over time? Yeah. If that's, if yeah. that's feasible, that, that's Yeah, I mean, uh, we are supposed to do this as well. This is the, the first analysis, but the, 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 the trend analysis, I mean, the, the, from 98 to 2016, it's not 2018, 2016, which is 18 years of data. So it's there, that's just need to be analyzed, yeah. And, and, and the second question is, uh, with, the, with the grid you showed for, for pollution, right, that comes from the, the diversity in Canada or yeah. US, yeah. how does that take into account Know, um, changes in, in, in rain patterns in the areas because this is an annual mean, yeah. right? And with diseases that we are interested in, which are very seasonal, you know, mm -hmm. within one year, of course, you know, how does it take into account? Because if you say increased or, or, or no effect on respiratory disease, yeah. are you diluting the effect of air pollution because you are, you know? Yeah, that's the, that's the, the problem with working with means. I mean, the effect of air pollution usually is a short term effect on means. If you breathe air pollution today, you're going to become you in the next two days. Uh, of course, that is a, a chronic effect. I mean, if you're always living on a place which is very polluted, you're also going to have some uh, health problems due to that, you know, chronic exposure. Uh, the thing here, I mean, using annual means, we lose some of the information, for sure. The, the, the annual means, they are, you know, adjusted by, you know, uh, because a satellite measurement is the uh, aerosol optical density, and they are adjusted by uh, the monitoring stations that are available. But they are, of course, they are not everywhere. And they are also weighted by uh, using a geochemical model, which I don't know exactly how, how it works, but there's no meteorological uh, consideration on, the, on this modeling. And, and it didn't consider any seasonality because it's an annual mean. It's possible to work with <laughs> daily data. I mean, we can also download daily data, but then you have to do the whole process of, you know, uh, Waiting it by, by you know daily monitoring stations where it, it is available and doing the whole process to get the data ready for use, but it's possible. It's quite a lot of work. This daily data and is, and you see, I mean, for for these hundred and, and four hundred cities, uh, three hundred seventy one cities uh, for this uh, for one year. I mean, it's quite a lot of uh, download data that you have to download and then uh, because each point is a is a is a value, so you have to organize to. To calculate the means for that, um, you know, for the boundaries to define. So it's a bit of, you know, quite a workload. What cities got uh, the, the station to measure these pollutants? Uh, sorry, say again. Most of the cities got the station to measure these pollutants. Well, we, we, we also collect the data on, on monitoring stations, um, and it's much less. I mean, um, I don't have the numbers. I, I might have it in, a, in my pen drive on, on, a, on another file. Uh, but it's about, in terms of cities, it's about 100 cities. Um, no, it's a bit more, I think. It's, uh, I can't really say the number of cities, because we counted the number of stations as well in different countries. So I, I, I have these tables, I can show you. I think I have on my, on my pen drive, because we also collect this data, which is See, a different source. But not source. everywhere, have you? Have no, no, it's much I less. Mean, I mean, the, the, the advantage of um, satellite data, it's universal coverage. We have it everywhere. 
I mean, precision is not good. I mean, I, I think someone is going to present that I saw on the program. Sure. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, so sorry. Like well, someone sorry. perhaps is going to present, but I mean, it's a very good data. I mean, this one, uh, the resolution is quite good. It's one kilometer uh, by one kilometer. Some other data you have 10 kilometers is the resolution, which is much larger, so it's, you, you lose some, some uh, information when you have a very large uh, uh, grid. But the, oh, oh, you were talking here uh, very shortly about because you, like the, in, in CDAX you are creating some structure that it can have the longitudinal data. Yeah. Right? And how you see to, to uh, connect this data, a yeah, serial of this data with uh, longitudinal events. Yeah, you can in some way mimetize oh, yeah. Yeah. large human cohorts yeah. Yeah, to, yeah. to follow up the effect on things. You How just need to that? define the boundary, I mean, the, the, your unit, let's say Salvador, a city, or you know, you define the unit and then you calculate the, 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 the air pollution. I mean, you have it for 1998 uh, to 2016. I mean, there might be you know updates on this on this data set soon, but so far we have 18 day, 18 years of data, and you can yeah you can you know assign population at the beginning at the end of this period and see differences, and see patterns. Uh, it's possible. I'm trying to think about the trade-offs between um, the benefits of visualization and, and the um, health costs, I, and I I wonder what these um, percent decreases is this already controlling for the effect of uh, increased income? Or is this just um, Yes, it is because it's taking into account, oops. It's, it's all of the variables in your full model. Yeah. So then, don't we? It's taking into account, I mean, because this is the full model. It's 1% increase or 1.3% increase in the full model. So it's taking into account for the, the country GDP. Although here we are not, Looking at increase because we are doing a cross-section on that. Yeah. So. No, I'm, I'm just wondering if um, uh, if the number that we want is um, is actually not accounting for the ben the benefits of income because then uh, potentially we're uh, we'd be able to understand that there are these, these um, benefits and costs to um, uh, to the PM two point five. Not just the costs. Yeah, but I mean, you all, which benefits could be from? from? From the benefits of income. Ah, right. Yeah, but I mean, here we, we, we cannot disentangle this. Thanks for this presentation, it was very interesting. Uh, something that actually caught my attention was the, most of the variation was within city, right? Yeah. Not across cities. And uh, you have the opportunity to analyze similar cities. Uh, in different aspects, so let's say income and GDP and population size, that actually they behave differently when mm -hmm. you have these outcomes. So they should behave uh, in a similar manner, but they actually are very different uh, in the outcome. Yeah, no, this is this is a nice idea. I mean, we haven't we haven't explored this in this sense, no. And and it's true. I mean, the the, the most of the variations is within city, and and also I mean the fact that we didn't see any. Uh, difference in exposure by gender or, or socioeconomic, which is the, my main interest, is because we are looking at, you know, although it's sort of small, I mean, when you say city, but it's, I mean, for Sao Paulo, as, for example, is one city, it's our L2. The whole metropolitan area, which is 20 million, becomes one L1, our, our city. So we, you cannot see differences at this level. You have to go at L3 or, uh, you know, uh, on a smaller level to see this difference. But again, uh, you can have you know, a better uh, definition or, or discrimination of socioeconomic differences, but the air pollution becomes a bit more difficult to get at this level. So it's a, it's a sort of trade-off. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, uh, I would like to ask you, if you know people to come to a conclusion, why Chile has such a, such a so much higher values? Because of the Andes? Is it geographic? Oh, Santiago, or? yeah. Perhaps most of this is driven by Santiago and, and Chile. They use other know, Alejandro. I know. I, I know you are not from from Chile, but I mean they use quite a lot of kerosene. Uh, indoor air pollution is quite high there as well. But she, uh, Santiago is very because it's surrounded by mountains. It's very very polluted. Yeah. 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 Ye
the geography of, of the place. Yeah, but I'll, I think geography explains for Santiago, but not for all the, the other cities. And they have quite a lot. I mean, I don't know how many cities in Chile, but 60% of them are, are above the guidelines. Try to get sort of more comparable cities right. and see if the same like pattern keeps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank okay. you. So ensuring that we need to ensure that cities can protect and improve health and well-being while also constraining inequalities to so reducing those differences between the richest and the poorest living within cities. But actually in health geography, so it's the field that I'm primarily within, most of the studies assume, so they'll take an individual and create a buffer or describe the polygon of where that individual lives and then see what type of environment they live in and then how that's associated with health. But actually, the whole urban area might be available to people. So most people are living in cities, most people are highly uh, mobilized, most people are able to move around the cities. So actually maybe not just that um, neighborhood around where somebody lives, but the entire city may have an influence on their life. But, Actually, how we can measure this and understand this 
um, its variety, distribution, and configuration. There aren't many studies in health, uh, public health epidemiology that explore this. And that's what we set out to do, is explore how the whole city environment may affect life satisfaction and potentially inequalities, um, socioeconomic inequality and life satisfaction within people living in cities. <coughs> and we borrowed some ideas and techniques from ecology, and the previous Nelson mentioned a few of them, uh, which look at the landscape. Uh, so how an area containing a mosaic of different habitats or elements can influence health. So it understands the different patches of land that were in a place. So you know, for animals this may be the habitat. So how the best habitats that animals can thrive in. So it looks at patches of places, uh, the matrix, the, the configuration, and then corridors. So if we think about this as a city, we would have our patch where we live, the dense residential areas and then the corridors where we safely travel so the roads within the city and how these are configured within an urban place. So why would the content and configuration of a landscape affects residential well-being? Well, we based our understanding on Gibson's theory of affordance and this hypothesizes that different people want different things from their environment at different times and actually why the variety of environments uh, but which are easily accessible can improve health so not so being in a place where you have access to lots of different types of places and spaces can be good for individuals health regardless of whether you use them or not but knowing that you have the opportunity could potentially uh, generate greater life satisfaction for a city's residents so for example, green spaces, you might not use them, but knowing that you live in a green city could influence health. So for our study, we looked at this and made objective measurements of the urban landscape and related them to subjective measurements of life satisfaction, and then looked at within city inequalities in life satisfaction across 66 European cities. And we extracted land cover data. So we extracted this from the European Urban Atlas. And this is a European data source, but similar types of data sources are available in different uh, geographical places across the world. And what this does is it, it uses satellite images and digitizes them um, at a 10 meter square resolution into 26 land classes. So here we have London. And what it does is it digitizes that information uh, so it looks something like this. So our GIS software can process it and understand it. And the 26 land classifications that the urban artist uses. So you can see it classifies it into the river. So you can see the river in the center. And then these gray areas are the residential areas of the city. But also classifies them into dense residential areas. So there's inner city compact places and also less dense residential areas, so areas where we have gardens, which may be surrounded by gardens, there's different types of classification. And also the roads that run throughout the city, the type of parks. And what's really interesting and useful is the way it classifies uh, green space because it picks out those pocket parks which are those de uh, places within the denser parts of the city and also those natural green spaces that haven't really been influenced much by humans. And what we could do for those 66 European cities, we could actually look at what is the makeup of each city and look at some box and whisker plots to see what the mean proportion range and interquartile range of the land covers are for all of the cities. And we can see that overall there are types of land use within cities that dominate but there is actually quite a range. So if we look at the whiskers in the plots, there is a range between differences within cities. But most of these cities are, as we'd expect, made up of dense residential areas, uh, industrial areas, commercial and public. But within these 66 European cities, some have quite a lot of arable land and pastures. So there is difference between the makeup of the cities. And then we looked at measures of land use, diversity, and evenness. So the first measure we used was to look at the diversity of those land classes within the city, uh, which we used as Shannon's Diversity Index. 
And a good way to explain it is to look at the most diverse and the least diverse city. So you can see the most, the least diverse city, which is the graph on the left, is Athens. And this is a really, it has low diversity because actually it has relatively few land uses within the city boundary. So mostly it's made up of those urban residential types of places. And then Rostock in Germany is a highly diverse place. So it pretty much has every single land use within that city. So it's a really diverse place with lots of different land uses within there. And then we looked at evenness. So this is different diversity because it takes into account the number of land covers, but then how evenly distributed they are. So we can see Dublin on the left has low evenness because although it has quite a number of land uses there, it's still dominated by dense residential areas. Whereas Amsterdam, which has a similar-ish number of land uses within it as Dublin, but actually it's quite even. And we can see that about, there's about eight land uses where the distribution is quite even throughout the city. And then we used data about the individual to look at our, how um, individual level data from the European Urban Audit. And the European Urban Audit uh, matches the geographical boundaries of the Urban Atlas. So we had two geographical similar data sets. So this is an individual within the city. So we didn't know where in the city they lived, but using our hypothesis that the entire city can influence health, uh, that's how we brought these two data sets together. And this is a data set which we pulled for 2012 and 2015. And it's a telephone survey that asked adults within the city a range of topics. Um, and we used a measure of income, um, or economic, socioeconomic status, which was um, how people expressed their difficulty in paying the bills. And our outcome measure, which was a binary outcome of yes, no, whether they were satisfied with the life they lead, was a question which asked them whether they were very or fairly satisfied. Mm -hmm. Uh, or not very satisfied, or not at all satisfied with the life period. So we can see life satisfaction range by city. So it goes from about 50% uh, to over 96%. And this is quite typical of European cities. So the cities with the lowest life satisfaction were the Greek cities. Um, so but if we think about when the study took place, it was between 2012 to 15. So a time of economic instability for those Greek countries. And the cities where the residents reported the highest life satisfaction uh, were no surprise for us, which were Zurich in Switzerland and Oslo in Norway, which we know are happy, good places to live. And then we just looked at some descriptives to see how land use diversity was associated with um, our outcome on the y-axis of satisfaction with the life you lead. And we saw that there was some uh, relationship there uh, between land use diversity, so quite a small relationship, but there was something going on. And it was similar for evenness, which showed us that potentially this required further investigation. So we modelled life satisfaction in a series <coughs> of mixed binary logistic regression models. And in total, we allowed for the clustering nature of the data. So we had individuals within city, within country. And in total, there were around 64,000 individuals who were included in the sample. So around 1,000 people per city. So our, our, what we wanted to know was were the land uses associated with life satisfaction. Well, the city metrics, so in terms of how diverse or even they were, were not associated with life satisfaction. But there were particular land classifications within the city that were uh, related to increased life satisfaction. And they were pastures, isolated housing. So isolated housing is houses that are surrounded by greenness, so less dense, uh, more affluent uh, types of housing within cities. And related to decreased life satisfaction with dense residential areas of the city, more roads and more industry, and artificial green space, which is classified as urban green space. I thought this was quite interesting because it came up in the previous study presented by Nelson, where he found that association with green space. 
And when we investigated this further to find out, you know, why is green space of cities associated with less life satisfaction, which you wouldn't really expect. Um, but actually, it's the definition of the land, play, land mass because the urban atlas defines it really well. So in terms of more natural space, this is urban green space. So it's artificial, human, man-made. So we think it's more an indication of a dense residential built-up compact city because it's a place which potentially used to be green, has been developed, and then a new uh, pocket park has been built in that space. But interestingly, we actually found that, going back to those land classifications, that a more even distribution of land classes within a city um, was associated with lower levels of socioeconomic inequality. Um, so potentially having a more even distribution uh, reduced inequality in um, life satisfaction. We then went on to see, so we found some interesting findings with land uses within cities and life satisfaction, so quality of life. But then we wanted to know, does the proportion of particular land classes, um, are they related with mortality? And this comes back to a lot of work that's been done around the world, um, and in particular a study by my colleague, uh, Professor Richard Mitchell, who looked at um, green spaces within cities and found that more green spaces, more green cities uh, were re related with lower levels of all-cause all, um, all cause mortality and with cardiovascular disease. So we wanted to know other particular other types of city designs that related with mortality. And we use very similar methods with using the digitized satellite images. Um, but our outcome, we obtained city level, all age, all, um, all cause standardized mortality ratios for males and females. And then we looked at the quintiles of proportions of land uses within <laughs> cities, which are <coughs> factors, uh, factors along with GDP, and we modeled these in a linear regression model, allowing for the clustering nature within the country. So the outcome for this study, we found that actually there were land covers within the city that were related um, and had consistently uh, evidence of an association with standardized mortality ratios. And those that were associated with lower mortality rates within the cities were cities that had a lot more um, agriculture, semi-natural area of wetlands. So this is coming back to that definition of green space. So actually if we're defining green spaces as natural places they were related to lower mortality rates, forests and more sports and leisure facilities. And this was particularly for eastern regional uh, European cities. And cities with, this was with the highest proportion of industrial, commercial, public and military, lots of derelict land. And again, coming back to this green urban area, so those pocket parks uh, that potentially are more, more an example of compact city designs. So we did find that the proportion of specific land covers within cities is associated, was associated with mortality rates there. So this was looking at one time point associating uh, land covers with health. But actually, what about changing places and health? And this is something that we're working with, uh, with Maro, is how we can understand, um, how we can quantify change in selected built environment features over time for small areas and then be able to link these potentially to health outcomes. So we know that places have changed and what we've done recently is looked at examples in changes in housing, green space and roads and using similar methods to what we used in using satellite data and digitizing that. Uh, so for example here we can see on the left we have um, Google Earth data and then how this is digitized into a format that we can use within GIS software so we can quantify it in different ways and understand it. So this is a place that's gone from a green area on the left <coughs> and then we can see the change. There's a large housing development that was built in this area and how it's been digitized on the right. So you can see there's individual polygons for all of the new houses. They've been marked around the new road to there um, and the new geographical layout has been digitized into something that we can use. And again on the bottom, 
just another example of a new housing development um, that we can see that has been digitized. So we know this anecdotally for lots of small areas. Uh, we might know that there's a new housing development, but how can we scale this up for, at a national level into something that we could use potentially in a large national, international study to see how this is related to health? And that's what we've been doing using small area grid cells, where we wanted to look at a way of creating small areas to show change. So in Scotland, we've done this by creating 500 by 500 metre cells, and then for each cell, calculating change in the land classifications within that over one yearly period. And that was to look at the number of pit buildings, the area of woodland, and the total length of roads that have changed within those places. So we looked at the differences between the two time points. So we looked at whether there was no change, so the environment stayed the same, whether there was cell loss, uh, whether there was cell gain. And then, because potentially there might just be new, one new house, or one change to a road, or one small change in forest, so we also needed a way of calculating that to look at the various levels of loss or gain. So is it low, medium, or high? So has a green space entirely changed into a new housing development, or potentially has a housing development been taken away and has created a new green space, or a derelict plant that's turned into a green area? So this is what we did for Scotland, a way of trying this to see if we can use digitised data which we obtained from the Ordnance Survey in the UK, um, but it's a method that we want to use in different places such as uh, South America. And you can see that we can look at cells that have had gain or loss. So the blue cells are showing, in two, are showing an area that had gain, so you can see this place has changed from, um, there's been a new number of housing that has come here, and then there's a loss here, so there's just a small number of houses that have lost. So this within our classification would be something that had a small change. And then we looked at these particular aspects of building change. Uh, we had all of the different cells and we could see that over 80,000 cells that had buildings within it within Scotland, um, around 4% showed loss and 8% showed gain. And then we could look at particular cells that had a lot and see, is this just a small, tiny change of less than five buildings? Well, yeah, most places it was just a small change. So we can understand this at a national level, uh, what type of change, what type of developments are happening within those places. But actually, a very small number had over 10 buildings. And that's something that we could change in the methods to, to suit us and our analysis. And then we can see this in different ways. And we did this the same for roads and for woodland change. And then finally, we could look at whether there were multiple feature changes within a small area. And the great thing about small areas is then we can aggregate up, so potentially to a census track, um, to a different, to different, uh, to a region, to a state. So we can see the types of changes that are happening maybe within a city. Uh, within a state, within a census track, uh, as a way to then be able to understand what's happening within that city, within that place, and if that there is some association with health there. And what we've done in Scotland is we've just linked this very crudely recently to look at what the deprivation of that place is. And what we found in the recent just crude analysis is that actually places that have had a lot more roads are actually typically the most deprived areas of Scotland. Um, and we know that most road accidents occur in the most deprived areas, and that actually the most people who live in those deprived areas don't have access to their own car. So it's painting a picture of the type of places and potentially how that could impact their health. And this is adding an extra context to understand that place. So just to summarise, understanding how the urban form of mortality is associated with health is important. And this is uh, noted by the United Nations in their Sustainable Development Goals as a global challenge for all countries, and particularly relates to the three goals in uh, promoting good health and well-being, reducing inequalities, and creating sustainable cities and communities for the future. And research will help develop this evidence-based and targeted interventions to improve health 
and promote prosperity while protecting the planet. So we know, I think what this research adds is that the actual content and configuration of cities can be, is related to health, both life satisfaction and mortality, and there are proportions of specific land covers within cities that are associated with health and these vary by region and health. But few studies, and I think this is because we've been limited by the methods in the past, has actually explored changes to built environment change and how this is associated with health. And that's what we want to do in uh, the UK, use our study to understand built environment change and how that's associated with changing health outcomes. And also um, work with our colleagues here in Brazil to explore this uh, link to different types of interventions. So, thank you. I think that's why many studies haven't done it, right. because yeah. it is actually, it's quite difficult to do. Research to use. 
how do you see this in the Latin America context, for example? That you, there is no so much data available, not the, the efforts to to build something similar would be huge than is in Europe because a lot of things are read in yeah. some way prepared. How you see that when you talk that it's possible to do in, in so, Latin America? So that's what we're trying to explore uh, with Mario in Brasilia, is trying to understand what data is available to us that we can use. Um, and I was interested in the portal um, that was talked about earlier um, as a source. But if potentially it might require a lot of um, work behind the scenes now to create that digitized data or if there are ways that we can automate it and extract it. But I think that's something that we're trying to explore at the moment is how how we can create a similar data set that's um, reliable, of good quality, that then we can use. Thanks a lot for that. Um, so, if I remember correctly, the green spaces might have a negative effect on that satisfaction. And it's just, it's just to, uh, like, artificial green spaces, right? And uh, I think that's, that's very interesting because there is a movement of having open green spaces in very densely populated areas. So, how, how do you interpret that result and how that might be related with? Are very dense and large cities. So I think what our advice would be is there's lots of cities where you might have a green area and what you do is you would want to build a new development and you'd want to potentially destroy that green area that's existing in the natural space and then build a new development and create some sort of artificial in a city green park. So I think what our studies found is that actually trying to preserve those natural parts of the city is the better thing to do for health is maybe integrate urban design or not not build on natural like what we can see here those natural types of spaces. So let's thank John again. <laughs> we make a short break. Okay, uh, stand for eleven and eleven o'clock. We uh, we soon.
good memories. I used to live here in Salvador, so I'm so happy to be here again. Well, uh, I'm going to present to you a little analysis that I did eight years ago. I was thinking it's still at the value of this analysis. But uh, if you consider a country to study the impact of climate change, uh, well, Ecuador is a good example, not always by the location. For example, we are in a, in, in a warm area, but also if you see the, the country, you see that uh, we got uh, mountains across the entire country, right? So we've got different areas. You got the Amazon area, right? Uh, the and, uh, Andes area, so you can be the branch that uh, I think that the highest point is 6,000 meters above the sea level, and you go the flatlands close to the Pacific Ocean. Of course, if you know, uh, Ecuador got extreme <laughs> climate events as well as the Nino and the Nina, right? We got floods, so well we got uh, <laughs> a lot of issues related with, uh, with climate change. If you consider a uh, climate indicator uh, like a rainfall, well, in Ecuador is completely different to the north country that you go to different seasons, right? In Ecuador we just have the rainy season and the dry season. But no, not in all the country, because in the Amazon region, every year is a rainy season. It's just <laughs> quantity of rain that you got there, right? And you can see here the variation in the temperature in the four different cities. Quito, the capital of Ecuador, Guayaquil, uh, it used to be the biggest city in Ecuador, but now it's Quito. Uh, Puyo in the Amazon region, and as well, I forget to say that uh, the Galapagos Island belong to, to Ecuador, so it's a completely different region as well. Uh, there are many studies of climate change there. At the same as uh, the entire country, we did this study in the capital of Quito. As uh, you can see, this is the metropolitan area. It's not just the urban area. The metropolitan area comprises the urban area and the rural uh, area, right? But the, the, the problem here is that it ranged at 2,000 meters to more than 4,000 meters. So we go different environments in that small uh, space. As you can see, Quito is located in the middle of the mountains. Uh, we are close to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the glacier as well. But some parts have uh, got a subtropical, yeah, yeah, subtropical environment. So, yeah. This study was done only in the urban area of Quito. Uh, the information about uh, pollution in Quito wasn't not too good because just 15 years ago we, still, we got this uh, a station that measured uh, air pollutants, right? Now we have eight stations measure the pollutants, but as I said, the problem is this uh, station are located in different uh, altitudes, so it's quite difficult to, to, to see the, the real impact of, the, of the, this pollutant. As you can see, uh, we got a lot of information about the, the impact of climate change. We got a map of floods, landslide, poverty, social vulnerability. But we don't have a map of uh, the impact on the health indicators. That is uh, one problem. That's because, of course, the, the databases uh, were not available in that time. So what I did? Well, I just uh, evaluate the effects of climate change, climate variables, and air polluting indicators on several health indicators in the metropolitan district of Quito. I did an ecological time series study. Yeah, I use uh, the ur just the urban district, okay, uh, and I use secondary information, monthly hospital emissions, okay. <coughs> As well. I think that all we know about the direct and indirect impacts of climate change in the health indicators. So the idea was select different uh, hospital missions like uh, asthma and uh, allergic uh, diseases, malaria, dengue, and bacterial diseases, well, respiratory, waterborne diseases, 
and that, that is all. Just uh, the three or four uh, um, diseases related with the radiation as well. Uh, you know that Quito is located at three, uh, almost 3,000 meters above the sea level, so the uh, radiation is quite high at that altitude. Even if you are walking on the street, you are going to have these signs saying that, well, we got level 4, level 5, we use uh, sunscreen, please use a hat because the radiation is quite high. We use that uh, disease as well. The good news is, uh, that that is the reason that I'm here as well, is to present that 15 years ago, ago we didn't have a good uh, information system, a national information system. But some years, uh, the last seven years, I think, six, uh, five, or six, seven uh, years ago, uh, the government just created the national information system. Just put together all the databases in one, uh, uh, one website. The good news is, for example, we got good information about socioeconomic indicators, about hospital admissions, mortality data, uh, economic data. And the important part is uh, we got the Geographical Institute of Ecuador uh, that they provided uh, all the maps that we need in the country. We, we got a lot of information about that because, as I said, uh, Ecuador, by the special location, uh, we got a lot of information with climate change, but not exactly in health indicators. Okay? But at least we, we, we got a lot of information, uh, geographical information. Uh, we got uh, a special uh, website for climate change. I think it's in, in the Secretaria de Gestión de Riesgo. I don't know how do you say it. Risk. Uh, risk, <laughs> risk management. Risk management. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But the, the good news is that we got all this information in one site. We got the information. Now, and most of the information is available. It's free of it. This is the, uh, the web page. So you can go there and start to, 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 to look the information. And the important thing is that uh, the information is classified in different, uh, different areas, right? As you can see, it's 15 areas, and you can choose uh, the health, and you can have all the indicators of hospital admission and, uh, the, and the, the information, the mortality information. Okay, well, we got uh, more information, but I think it's not quite related to, to, to climate change. Okay, so what I did, I just classified uh, hospital admission in different uh, groups, waterborne disease, vector-borne disease, air pollution disease, and disease related with solar radiation. Uh, I use international classification of disease, so I use monthly monthly information about these hospital admissions. Then, I just correlate this information with uh, climate variables and, of course, uh, uh, pollution variables as well, right? The bad news in Ecuador is just, we just, got, uh, we just have two cities with uh, a station to measure the, the pollutants, Quito and Cuenca the third biggest city in Ecuador. Unfortunately, Guayaquil is the second big city. We don't have this, this, this system. But the system in Quito is quite reliable. Of course. Uh, as a result, we just analyzed trends. Because uh, we were interested in uh, these diseases just increase or decrease across the time. Uh, the waterborne disease, well, some of them increase, but most this disease uh, just decreased across the time. Okay? Dengue, uh, paludismo, and leishmaniasis, they stay, right? Because as I told you, we, we, we found some uh, cases with dengue, but most of these people were people who work in the coastal region and just uh, go back to the, to the city. So we didn't find any, any evidence that dengue cases or vector diseases is increasing in this, in this area. We did find an increase uh, in pneumonia. Uh, well, bron bronchitis and asthma uh, stay steady. And rhinitis, we found an increase in the cases of in, in the district of Quito. As you can see, uh, diseases related with radiation, we got an increase uh, of these diseases. 
and we correlate all these uh, uh, hospital admissions with temperature, maximum temperature, median, min minimum, uh, rainfall, humidity, and uh, other uh, variations. So it was interesting because, for example, uh, respiratory diseases, uh, of course, they, they, they are correlated with the seasonal uh, in temperature and humidity. As well, as well, we found the correlations with humidity and pre uh, precipitation. And well, you can see here the, 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 the trends in, in the time as well of the, the uh, radiation disease related diseases. When we cross a, a asthma or air, air diseases, the respiratory diseases with pollution indicators, we found, uh, well, I could say a considerable association with, with asthma. The, the only thing here is, for example, in that time, we didn't have enough information. I think we just have the information to the pollution indicator like six or seven years. But for the, 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 the health information, we got the, the entire 10 years. The good news is now we, we got information for 20 years. So the idea with this exercise is try to update this, 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 this uh, study. And of course, with your help, if you're interested, try to integrate more analysis, more, uh, uh, I, I want to say complicated analysis, but more. <laughs> So, in general, uh, what we found in this study is uh, we found some uh, evidence that some uh, variables, some health indicators related with climate change has increased in the last 10 years. Uh, respiratory diseases as asthma was correlated, positive correlated with the pollution indicators. And it's probably that in the coming years, the number of people with uh, diseases related with radiation increased as well. Okay, so here is, an, uh, I will tell you, an invitation to help me in this, <laughs> in this analysis because it was done uh, eight years ago, as I said. So Ecuador's is, uh, we don't have enough information about uh, the implication with climate change. So I open your, to your questions and uh, to your help as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro. The questions and comments to. Is this that correlation done on a daily basis or annual? What does it monthly, mean? Monthly. Monthly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we already got the daily <coughs> daily information, monthly information. Done. But we choose monthly information because we got more points to correlate yeah, along the, the time. Yeah. Both, uh, both uh, environmental variables and, and health variables, could you uh, distinguish uh, which, which exactly variable, atmospheric variables can be related to health outcomes, for instance? Asthma with uh, particulate matter, but uh, but uh, some respiratory disease with with uh, nitrogen and uh, well, it's a, ozone it's, with yeah, it was a little difficult because uh, at the time uh, we didn't start very well with this, this this information. Although, for example, we know that. Uh, Asthma and respiratory diseases are related with the seasonal of the, of the year, right? And we found, for example, that uh, humidity in the house is related with, with the cases of asthma. And of course, we, we found that at the ecological level, <coughs> humidity as well was was related with the, the with the increase in numbers of asthma, right? As well, I, I uh, I'm doing the trends in mortality and morbidity in asthma. And we found it in the in the country that, for example, the places with more humidity, this is the Amazon region, got a higher rate of mortality and hospital admission. Yeah, it makes sense. But uh, with the pollution variables, 
well, the, I think it's still uh, in debate, right? If, if this uh, information is, cor is directly correlated with the, the occurrence of asthma or not. Because some studies say it's related and other studies say mm -hmm. no. Alejandro, um, the data you have, have you seen any trends in changes in uh, humidity, precipitation, or temperature over? No, 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 no. We didn't have, we didn't have a change. We didn't, we didn't have a significant change. Uh, did you have some any unexpected correlation between some outcome and pollution or climate change? And then an unexpected correlation, positive or negative one. Well, we when we were doing this analysis, uh, we wanted to, to find a correlation with the quantity of light, right, for the radiation. But uh, we, we didn't find it. Although the the, the, the number of people with uh, uh, diseases related to radiation increased, it was. Uh, uh, we were disappointed, but I think we need to, to use up the better indicators of, of, of this, uh, this uh, effect, right? The radiation, for example. And as I told you, unfortunately, although we have eight stations to measure pollution, all these stations are in different parts of the, of the, of the city. The city got different altitude, and, and uh, as well, the, 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 the rainfall is completely different in, in this in this part in the south of the city, but you, you should, you must consider that Quito got 50 kilometers long. Yeah, it's quite narrow, it's like 2 kilometers narrow, but it's a 50 kilometers long. So the variation is quite, it's quite high. So we need better, maybe better indicators of pollution and radiation as well.
yeah. your graph that uh, so collecting the precipitation index in those areas and the equivalence of danger this is a last way of uh, seeing how it takes from one year to the other the yeah other. we even do the look uh, for the for the cases because uh, of course we want to see if the vector is, is getting higher and higher but uh, as i told you most of these cases yeah all these cases were people that were working in, in the coast region they just go back to uh, what's the average temperature in Quito? Well, it's, uh, it is a big range because in the, in the morning you can be 1, 2, 3 degrees and the midday it's at 25, 26, 27 and again it drops to, to 5 degrees. Yeah. And this has a great influence on the, on the, on the cycles of the vector. The vector proliferates yeah. or does not proliferate? Well, the keto, I don't think so, but in the respiratory disease is it's completely related to all these uh, cycles. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? So, let's. Uh, 
uh, use it né, uh, in a more uh, ambitious way in order to tackle uh, other research questions. And so, if you want to, to make some comments and think about how this uh, idea could be used, né, I think it would be a very uh, brainstorm in this, in this direction. <coughs> My first question to be, if all, all those millions of registers are already geocoded, the AHB, at the address and... Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, at the ba ba base here, we think that we, the best uh, results that we have reached, it's about 8, 5, 8, 6 percent of geo geocode. Okay? Is that a correct voice? I think that's about yeah, the more time later. You have some years already show coded, uh, uh, and you also the birth data in Brazil. The birth data, I don't know the level it is, but it, for example, the mortality data you got uh, 80, a f a more than over 80 percent of the show code. That's I think the, the highest level of show code you are at on in Brazil, yeah, uh, because one part of the data don't have a possibility to localize, you know, because the, the address is not full and text. But then you are using different methods of your coding, you have improved it uh, to over 80% already. But there is a group here working on that. Yeah? You try to use include a software that was developed here to try to see if it has capacity to code. Yeah. Because this has an implication in, in which scale we will use? If the lo more local scale, streets, uh, blocks, or municipalities? Mm -hmm. No, you are show coding at the census tract level. Yeah. It's, uh, this 80% is a census tract level. Yeah. How large is the census tract? Yeah. Uh, it's it's not geographically defined. It's a, it's a general population of 600 people. Yeah. Then in the urban area is relatively small. In rural areas is larger. Yeah. But there is near 400,000 census tract in Brazil. The, the, the territory of Brazil is is composed by near 400,000. In Sao Paulo, one census tract can be a building. building. <laughs> Copan is a building. It is a, I, I, I presume that Copan building is a census tract. Okay. Okay. I, I was also going to bring up the, the scale problem because there's a there's a data architecture um, decision that often needs to be made when you're combining uh, individual local data, gridded data from something like satellites or or um, weather and uh, GIS polygon data such that um, you can't necessarily put them all together into the same database mm -hmm. in a way that uh, that's very easy to use. You, you sort of have to either standardize on one or the other or um, uh, or have ways to crosswalk between them. Um, there's a system at a, a research um, lab called SYSYNC, the Social Ecology uh, Social Ecological Synthesis Center in the U.S. that has a um, uh, an architecture um, mm -hmm. designed for solving this problem. Um, they might want to look at, but but I'm I'm sort of I'm curious if, if you guys have thought about how to try to piece these together. Mm -hmm. I also would like to comment on this because you talk that you was access of data from a, a center in the U.S. also. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's Canada, the Dallas. Oh, okay. I mean, it's a website. I mean, you can you can get it. I mean, it's free for for accessing for anyone. It's a, uh, it's on the website. Uh, I mean, there are other sources of data. I mean, for, for satellite data, that, I mean, the the NASA has quite a lot of data, and I I haven't tried, but I think it's also possible to download. I mean, to 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 access it for most of it. But, the issue is that then there's a there's a lot of work that needs to be done to take yeah to, to sort of match up yeah the data. thing with this Dalhousie Dal University is that they they have already done all the the modeling before so because we the satellite data they 
doesn't measure PM2.5, it measures the uh, aerosol optical density, AOD. And then you have to transform that readings into PM2.5, which is a bit of work. I mean, the, the, the advantage of this data set that I showed that it's already calculated, so it's, it's already PM2.5. I, I think that uh, this is a, actually a crucial issue to put together these kinds of uh, two information, information on climate and information on health. Mm -hmm. I myself, I did some 25 years ago, I accessed at uh, INCOR, National Center for Antimicrobial Research in, in Colorado. Uh, and from there, I, I, I took some data from Brazil. Yeah, they have much more, data, better data on rainfall in Brazil than we had here uh, at, uh, at INPE or at, uh, at uh, here in Salvador on the uh, regional basis. And, uh, and I presume that in this 25 years, the amount of data that then is really. But then I think that for putting together health and environmental data, the way of putting this is a crucial issue. That I think that any project has to, to, to be, and the expertise of both people use it to, to work on uh, technologies of climate uh, science uh, is uh, essential to, in order to know how to, to put the things together. Okay, that's from an, uh, what can say at this stage. And so, uh, Anna, uh, it's you now. Great, <laughs> okay. thank you. <laughs> okay, we re can resume a few talks, we can think more about yeah. this. <laughs> it uh, was great, sorry for that. Uh, yeah, it was zero. There was no information in my previous uh, presentation, so that's not what I want to do. Best. I don't know, uh, where's the... Yeah, I'm not very technological today, but I'm, it's not going to take long. So, uh, as uh, Roberto was saying, and it's very, very important, right, to connect these uh, health outcomes with uh, environmental and climatological data, but it's not very, actually, Sometimes it's not very easy to do. So I'm doing my PhD at the University of Economics, and my main uh, question and my main interest is understanding which kind of health-related impacts climate change might uh, might produce. And uh, I'm interested mainly in Brazil and in Latin America as a whole. And here, uh, these are work that uh, I'm doing with uh, the team here at Stax. Um, and uh, so we are very mature state, very preliminary. Um, but we want to discuss how we can actually go deeper in some of the relationships uh, that uh, Gustavo and uh, 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 Jonathan and uh, many other researchers here were talking about a little bit of these relationships within cities and how that can actually be done. So, no, I the urban morphology and the intent building, as we can imagine, right? It, it really depends where you live in the city and different socioeconomic outcomes. Not just. <laughs> this computer doesn't like each other, that's for sure. <laughs> so, so different different areas of the city, not just socioeconomic outcomes, but also which kind of materials the building is uh, actually built in the built environment, if you live in a house or in a building, and how does that play a role, or how does that might play a role on uh, infectious diseases, but also air pollution and this kind of morphology. So, uh, the main uh, effect or the main mechanism that can be attributed to the morphology of the cities and climatological outcomes is the urban uh, heat island, and I think there will be more people talking about it later on. But the idea here is that different structures, the vegetation, the land use uh, of different cities might have an impact on this urban climate, this microclimate, or this more localized climate. So when you think, there are a lot of associations being done with that. When you think about the heat stress, there are associations and uh, trying to find causal relationships with cognitive abilities and with not just health outcomes but also labor productivity and different parts of uh, economic growth that might have an effect or might be affected by it. 
So when you think about urban heat, heat island, it's really the idea that the city as a phenomenon is actually uh, the heat effect inside the city is higher than in their surroundings or outside the city, right? So when you think about extreme heat uh, outcomes and effects, this can be related to uh, heat strokes or dehydration that's a very a short term and direct effect. But there might be other indirect or longer term effects as well. And when you think about cardiovascular and asthma, vector borne diseases, which um, is very directly health associated. But as Jonathan was saying, there is also like life satisfaction that might have an effect on mental illnesses and other, uh, uh, other health outcomes as well. So the interesting thing is that our socioeconomic vulnerability is associated with this uh, heat island effect. So you might imagine that uh, in, within a city there could be a similar association or a similar perceived risk for different communities in different parts of the city. But that's not really the case. So when you think this is a, um, a paper that tried to analyze 25 cities in the world and their different associations between income inequality and uh, who was more affected by uh, this heat island effect. So when you think about this quadrant here, that would be um, a city that would have low income inequality and the inequality would have an effect or the inequality on this heat island effect would have an effect on the less affluent. So when you think about it, uh, so many cities would be here, right? Berlin and Mexico City and Tokyo. So that would be, let's say, a pro-wealthy uh, kind of like pollution and uh, health effects. So meaning that even though there is low income inequality, if there is a health effect related to the heat island, this effect would be more predominant on the, the less affluent, right? The scenario that we don't want to see, or at least let's say a pro poor kind of heat island effect that would be very damaging to poor populations, would be really high income inequality and the less upward, which is the case of Johannesburg, for example. Meaning that there is a high difference in income and this difference plays an important role on the concentration of this Italian effect on the poor. So Paulo here, um, kind of surprising, I, I thought, uh, from, the, from his study, from their study, they say that there is a high income inequality, but this, the burden of uh, heat island effect, it's more prevalent and the more affluent. So that's a relationship that's actually very interesting to analyze. Why is it that the more affluent would have a higher impact of, the, 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 of this uh, effect? So this, the, so this is uh, similar to what the motivation to what we are planning to do here in Salvador. And Salvador is a very interesting city to analyze this for many aspects. One interesting aspect is that when you think about respiratory systems, it's kind of stable for, for the past years in this uh, IPG um, data. But the city, which is a big city, almost 3 million people, uh, has a higher concentration of people earning a very low uh, monthly income. And that concentration might be spread around the city, right? When you see, uh, you know, if you're walking around the city, you see that there are neighborhoods or very small patches of the city that have high buildings and probably well of uh, citizens living there, connected to or just next to uh, houses with uh, lower uh, income population living there as well. So perhaps even the same zip code, the same area, there are a huge difference in income inequality that there might be or there might be not, and that's a question that we uh, want to raise a um, higher risk to different diseases related to that. So when we think about the topographic uh, idea of the city, so we see that it's not even distributed higher, it's high in one part of the city, low in the other part of the city, and, uh, and is there a effect of this topographic situation on health outcomes. 
think about the road system uh, as well. So especially when you think about air pollution, air pollution is very connected to, uh, to road system as we were discussing a little, a little bit earlier. So is there, here we saw it was higher and there is a more higher concentration of the road system as well. And here there is lower, probably a higher population density in this area as well. So which kind of concentrations, which kind of uh, measures are more important to decide uh, or to determine which kind of uh, health outcomes are involved in that. So when you think about the hydrography of the city as well, is there any association by say, when you see, in the case of dengue, for example, the accumulation of water and this kind of relationships, perhaps the accumulation of uh, hydrography or rivers and uh, this kind of uh, water systems and air pollution distribution that also affects the entire effect, right? Because there will be more humidity in certain areas than in other areas. So here's just an example of uh, these uh, surface uh, heat island intensity in Salvador. So these are very small, one by one kilometer uh, grid. And here we can see that it's not even distribu distributed the temperature at all. So here it's summer days, uh, but still when you see this area of the city is much, uh, much, much hotter when you compare it to the outside of the city than this area, for example. Although this area is higher, right? So the elevation is similar, but the temperature is very different. And that, that's an indication, that might be an indication of something that we need to, to look further. Are there any kind of differences? And we, when you look at different years, so this is 2015, 2016, 2017, although, although there are, the intensity is different, it's different, right? It's sometimes higher, sometimes a bit lower, but the areas are very, very similar throughout the years. So, so then when you think, for example, here, it's just one patch of Salvador, uh, we see that the type of housing on that area is different from the type of housing in this area, but even so this area, there are uh, a mixed kind of structure in the city. So high buildings, but also some houses, and this house could be high income uh, families or low income families, right? because there are also these gated communities where high-income families, families also live. So something that's, that's been one of the objectives as well is understanding, are people protecting themselves against some, um, some health effects by living in abuse, uh, in comparison to living in houses, for example. So when you look at the, the same area with, um, this is, so this is a 3D image of the, of the city, and then here you can see the height. So where people live is very, very close to the, so in houses, or uh, in buildings, very high buildings, or a little bit lower buildings. And <coughs> the idea is indeed to analyze the differences according to the height of the building and where people live. So here in this area is Amaralina in Pituba, and they are very, have very different um, social economic status. So, uh, as I was saying, the literature, the literature um, have uh, raised many uh, concerns about the impacts of climate change and environmental and built environments on health. And our objective is understanding what does the build up area, the build up environment, um, and its interactions with air pollution, interactions with many uh, health outcomes, might have an effect. And how can we explain heterogeneity inside, within the city, as has been discussed a little bit earlier, uh, according to this build up environment in the areas? So we are going to use, uh, they did use like land use change data, glucosity, and urban canopy, and human density to explain these uh, different areas, and also climatic uh, data. So just as to, to close, so a warmer urban climate, as, as is expressed here for Hong Kong, uh, has an effect on acute mortality and pneumonia, 
um, and the urbanization and climate change relationship that might have this association is, is this is just an indication, but there might be other health effects associated with it as well. So the urban heat islands can exacerbate this adverse health impact, and especially when you think about um, climate change and projections of climate change until the end of the century, understanding these differences inside the city and also understand the, the possibility of having these exacerbation of effects uh, is important. So yeah, uh, if you have any comments, it would be very much appreciated. And I'll try to understand uh, this kind of relationships, and uh, thank you. Okay, <coughs> comments and uh, questions to, to, to Anna? It was clear, that's a bit <laughs> <laughs> Is it, is it present in your 3D maps? Because they seem to show the hottest areas of the city with the high rise, uh, which I'm guessing is where maybe more of the affluent people live. Uh, you mean by the color? Yeah. Sorry, uh, I should have explained that. Oh, so the color means the height. Oh, so, so it's like getting, the, yeah, so yeah. getting uh, uh, redder, like more and more red, just means that it's getting higher and higher the, the height of the building. Oh, in that okay. area, so greener, it's just like lower. Oh, okay. I misunderstood. I thought that was a uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, sorry. Oh, <laughs> that was a bit of a yeah. That's the thing with yeah. like color, right? So, so yeah, it's just that you need the, the heights of the places, um, right? So it's not that here there is no climatic effects or or, or data at all. But what we can find is the same one. Imagine this is going to be because it's the same one. The boy. Ah, this is a, a laser scan image produced in 2016 over this the city. So it's not the temperature, but the high tops of the yeah, the in the, the lower. Yeah. yeah, but in a climate presentation, it's like very clear. Yeah, it's really like associated exactly about uh, temperature, but it's not like yeah. just yeah. the height. So you can trim all the colors. Yeah, the yeah. color is the same, yeah. but the the data is not it's different. Yeah. But John, you might be interested to know that I think when Anna and I were talking, some high rises aren't all high rises are not necessarily all high income. Uh, so which I think is a yeah, problem. yeah. So there are people living with different socioeconomic status living in different types of housing. So you could have a lower socioeconomic status living in a building, but also a lower socioeconomic status living in a house, and the same for well of families as well. So not necessarily so the the height of the building has some association, but it's not does not necessarily mean that it's a well of family living there. So that's that's really interesting in itself when Especially in this kind of geography where you have people, you see you've got people who may be within the same zip code mm -hmm. um, or census tract where you've got some of the most deprived people that are the most affluent about how you're going to capture that in your study. Yeah, and that's actually the main challenge because there are many studies that use zip code, for example, to, and then if you do the average of income in that zip code, you're not really capturing the variation and the risk associated with this variation. Right, so the, the idea is indeed trying to understand and getting a very fine resolution to explore this variation and try to see if this variation has some connection with risk exposure. Yeah, I, as you know, you are developing here uh, the Prevention Index. Uh, you are working in the Prevention Index project. Yeah, that is already well advanced. Yeah, that is estimated by census tract. Yeah, you use census tract. To use it to estimate the deprivation index, then could it be a yeah, here in Salvador, right? No, for all Brazil, for, all Brazil, for right? Brazil, yeah, it's a Brazilian indicator that will be launched. You, you hope to this year you actually right. put this this uh, index for use, now for people to use, but also for Salvador. Yeah, some people are using. I start to explore this index for urban environments. There's a research in Minas Gerais mm -hmm. that they are doing a lot of things using our, our index to do analysis with data from Vigitel. Vigitel is a telephone mm -hmm. yeah, system okay. for, for collecting data on health. 
and the, this group is interacting with the uh, digital. And people here I explore relationship with some birth and mortality information. Yeah, and then you can. That's really good. Yeah. yeah thanks. Yeah. So you have a lot of interesting variables that you're going to be looking mm -hmm. at from this. Um, we might want to chat about some other verbs to add. I'm, I'm working on um, explaining drivers of urban heat island effects in the US. Right. And we've looked from the literature, we, we sort of collected a bunch of variables that people were talking about, like energy use, uh, building footprints, elevation, aerosols, and uh, albedo. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, albedo was by far the strongest predictor. Right. Um, and so you might want to include that. In have, have you done something with wind speed and yes. something like the direction, something like that? Right, there's, there's a lot of discussion of sort of um, wind tunnels in uh, in Bodhi. So to, to get at that, you need to have some um, better modeling of the, the meteorology than we did. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, no, I, I've been reading some people say, uh, talking about uh, comfort or climate comfort instead of right. temperature. Uh -huh. Because temperature is a yes. People can protect themselves from, 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 from temperature by uh, <coughs> modifying habits and air conditioning. Air conditioning, but comfort involves also humidity, mm -hmm. wind. Mm -hmm. So. Yes, so yeah, temperature is one of the indications, but there is also what's called a uh, wild bulb kind of temperature. That's the temperature that, uh, so that you are more comfortable with as well. So if, if after this threshold, for example, after uh, 30 or 35, then, uh, then it's not comfortable at all, and there are a lot of a healthy, strong health implications to it. So yeah, so temperature, humidity, when I was talking about wind direction and uh, and speed, because when you think about air pollution, for example, that's a very strong uh, measure as well, right? And albedo, that's, that's important as well. So there are a lot of different health, uh, actually climate outcomes that can be correlated together and try to explain that. Thank you. Okay, presentations are conducted, and so I think perhaps we, if you think it's not uh, useful, we can uh, discuss some, uh, to come to a small conclusion, or we go to, to, to lunch, and before starting, we can, we can, we can uh, take a good discussion away. Okay. Uh, I, I myself, I have a big concern, uh, concern about this uh, influence of uh, local uh, on health outcomes and so on. Uh, <coughs> taken over short period of time, plus health is condition is a long history now. And unfortunately, although we nowadays we have a huge amount of data, this is uh, for a short period. And so I think that uh, this uh, all the longitudinal start, uh, studies now that we can conduct, start conducting now, uh, can, can include a lot of people, but in the past we do not have such this detail. And this, I think it is a global uh, problem. Now, how could you uh, think to make a, a past projection of what happened uh, based on, on what we have now, I think that it's, mm -hmm. is it possible from, uh, you say, from intervals of following people for three, four, five years or ten years to get some kind of information of what could have been the reasons of this evolution, uh, how to reconstitute the past. Uh, <laughs> so I think uh, in, in physics this is something quite easy to do. You can project how the Big Bang occurred based on a huge <laughs> amount of data. <laughs> okay, but uh, is it possible to 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 
to seek to think based on data now also uh, how how could this history be generated? Uh, this I think, uh, from my point of view, is a uh, uh, challenge. But I don't think if you uh, share the same point of view. But uh, I think it's what I, I would like to keep as a contribution to this uh, to this people who live now here in this area and with under this comfort, uh, temperature comfort and so on. How can we infer what? Uh, what was the influence of her by, by the outcomes here now? Uh, it, it has asthma now, but he lives in a good, in a clean environment. Is that consequence of past events? Uh, something? Like I think in the case of asthma, we've got to two, uh, two separate things because asthma exacerbation is very much your exposure now, or you know, recently mm -hmm. last. While the occurrence of asthma, the development of asthma, will depend on earlier exposures. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at, for example, asthma deaths and asthma hospitalizations, then really the data you have now is probably good enough. Because good. you're not asking the question about what causes asthma, you're asking about what causes exacerbation, mm -hmm. which can lead to mm -hmm. hospitalization and death. And, oh. and that's probably, for things like development of cardiovascular diseases, you need previous information for a heart attack. Mm -hmm. Yes, may depend very much also mm -hmm. on what happens now. Uh, long yeah. memory yeah. or short memory even uh, disease yeah. uh, <coughs> it depends on a large uh, measure of uh, how you live it before that, that happens. Yeah, but uh, it's a discussion moment. I I'd like to explore with you. Uh, Christopher, a question that he put at the end of his comment. Say that one of the things that he, uh, will be desirable is from the health data, you make inference what's happened. Yeah, because in general, you work the other way around. Now mm -hmm. you try to, then uh, can you comment a bit more about that? Because yeah, I really, uh, I never was, Talk very much on that, yeah. Then yeah. maybe you can. No, you can explore yeah. a bit more. Uh, there is some experience yeah. on that, you know, and to to try to understand the contacts, basically yeah. what's going on on health events. Yeah. Can you give uh, an example for? There is a famous example now happening in, in the U.S. People <laughs> using uh, data mining big data discovered that all that rates are decreasing for black people, women, white, but, the, but uh, deaths are increasing in, in, in among, the, among white middle class males. males. It's a famous thing. And they, no, no, they, they saw this verify this in using health data and try to explain. The explanation is a little trap. Uh, <laughs> explanation explains mm -hmm. why why Trump is so popular there. <coughs> because this white male urban middle class are losing losing power, losing income employment and they, the, the main cause of this uh, that's among uh, young this young white human there is drug alcohol opioids and everything so uh, this, they started from a, uh, a phenomenon happening in health to try to understand the context you know so in Brazil we could, <coughs> I think we could try to, 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 to find something abnormal in, in asthma, for instance, <laughs> or respiratory disease, and then try to explain, to, to, to capture, to, to relate it to environmental factors instead of... That's my suggestion. Any other 
if let's close then this section, we start again at you will be conducted at two o'clock. Two o'clock. Right now, you could turn half an hour. Yeah. Yeah. I think maybe one and a half. One and a half. Because half. you you are half an hour. Okay. And then okay. 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 So we we'll start again at uh, uh, one hour thirty. Okay. Thank you.